Licenic, the podcast with a license to inform. This is your host, Thomas Brancato. Today, I have the distinct privilege and honor to be inviting Dr. Philip Reynolds. And in a moment, I'll just ask Philip to uh, fill us in on what he's been up to. Uh, but immediately, I was struck by his very interesting take on what a liberal state is and the wars that we find ourselves, uh, certainly after September the 11th, but quite possibly going before then. Uh, so we'll be jumping into that conversation in a second, but without further ado, Dr. Philip Reynolds, would you mind telling us a little bit about your background in academics and, and what you do today? Sure. I, uh, I got my PhD from uh, the University of Hawaii a few years ago, and uh, it was a great experience. Uh, I was in the Army, and uh, I do have uh, uh, some, some experience in Iraq and Afghanistan, and that's really what led to uh, my dissertation, which was trying to figure out why uh, big countries like the United States go to war in small places and, and then fail, uh, which, uh, which was, it was a great journey. And of course, the book Ouroboros, uh, it was the result of that, about four years of, uh, of work. This I find really interesting as well, the, uh, the connection between serving in the army and then studying what we could call war studies. Was this transition uh, smooth? Were you, were you uh, supported and propelled by any figures within the army or was this purely an, an independent trajectory for you? Uh, no, actually, uh, uh, I started in my program. I was actually selected for it by, by the army. Um, and then uh, as, as the war ended and some uh, the money uh, kind of started to dry up. I had to finish on my own, but I was supported. Uh, the The Department of Defense actually has a has a pretty long history of sending its officers out to the civilian academy to ask these questions and to 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 kind of bring that answer back. Right, the answer, uh, that perspective that you know, a theorist, uh, a professor might have would be very different from what a, a four star general has. Uh, and and uh, personally, you know, it was a journey. I had to question a lot of my uh, deeply held beliefs. I had to I had to expand my way of thinking. I kind of had to open myself up, put myself into a position of learning uh, in order to really internalize some of the, the heavier uh, readings um, that that I, I got into to lose Guattari. Foucault was actually a significant uh, part of, of what I did. I think you've had more success than I've had in uh, in wrangling with uh, Foucault. But uh, certainly what comes to mind is, to me, is Clausewitz, somebody who uh, has followed sort of this trajectory of, uh, you know, serving in, in a military context and then spending the, the last part of his life, of course, studying and publishing material that has now become, you could say, classic. He's sort of one of the names that you constantly hear whenever we do war studies. Has this, has this been someone you run into as well, Clausewitz, and, and what he studied? Yes. Uh, so uh, part of the one of the sub questions that I had to answer in order to kind of figure out the, the war machine was, you know, Clausewitz has outsized influence in Western militaries. And, you know, Clausewitz was a proponent of, of the single battle, the, the decisive battle. And he, he got that from studying the tactics of Napoleon. Napoleon was a uh, decisive battle, destroy the army. And then the, the enemy's capital is laid bare. You can you can dictate whatever terms you want. Uh, and so, so, so Clausewitz's philosophy is is how the West works. It is how the U.S., particularly the U.S., works. But the, the idea of the decisive battle doesn't work uh, when you get into these small wars in the periphery, uh, because you're not fighting a singular army with formations and generals. What you find yourself doing is you're fighting uh, tribes, clans, people for whom technology is an AK-47. Uh, and so, we, so in order to to answer why the uh, you know great powers lose these small wars, one had to understand Clausewitz. One of the imageries that I came across at the end of uh, the end of the thesis that I uh, was uh, lucky enough to find a copy of. Uh, your 2017 dissertation for University of Hawaii dealing with this topic, the liberal states and irregular warfare, was the image of Ouroboros. I actually had no idea what the Ouroboros was before I uh, before I came into it. I said it sounds faintly Greek, uh, and I had to, of course, Google the the image. But can you explain to to us what what is uh, an Ouroboros exactly, and uh, why why did you choose this imagery? Yeah, it is an it is an old image, and it goes all the way back to uh, Greek mythology. And and Cronus uh, was one of the father uh, of the gods, and uh, he was foretold in a dream that his children would kill him. 
And in order to stop this, he ate his children. And of course, uh, the only one who escaped was Jupiter, who consequently overthrew the Titans and became um, kind of the, the, the Greek god, uh, the, the foremost. And, and so that imagery was, was resonated with me because uh, there was a, uh, a phrase that Joseph Schubiter, who was a uh, German economist, came up with. Uh, and that, that uh, sentence, it's, it's actually iconic. Uh, when you talk about the war machine, and he says, uh, created by wars that required it, the war machine now created the wars it required. And, uh, you know, this was fascinating to me. I think Deleuze and Guattari actually get some credit for their 1979 book, 10,000 Plateaus, but it was Schumpeter first. And it's the idea that a liberal state, in order to secure itself, must keep its citizens happy. Uh, in order to keep its citizens happy, it must keep expanding. And so liberalism, this idea, sets itself up as the great good, and that in order to expand, in order to keep growing the economy that's going to keep its people happy, it has to go into the periphery. Well, the periphery is not blank. Uh, it's got people, it's got tribes, it's got mountains, it's got, uh, in some cases, states, uh, and, and that creates these wars. And so that's that's where this idea of the snake eating itself it, it 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 it's creating the problem that it's trying to solve. That's really what the Ouroboros was for me. Well, this is a fascinating imagery, on, and there's so much we can we can talk about. But I, I can certainly imagine that this is already, in many ways, a, a radical vision, a, a radical departure, if you will, from a lot of the traditional way of viewing international relations. Um, because it presupposes in many ways, as you said, creating our own monsters, creating our own enemies, and that there's something inherently, uh, just for lack of a better word, wrong with the liberal state that um, that finds such a violent solution to it to its own problems. And in fact, when you were saying that, I can't help but also think of George Orwell, who there's a quote buried somewhere, but also making the claim. I think he mentioned it as the liberal state, but certainly the capitalist state finds wars in order simply to uh, to offload all of its excess, all of its material excess created by uh, the industrialized capitalist system, and that when a state gets too rich, uh, you know, they would send sort of their, their, their pawns of industry off to, to die with the materials they create. And anyway, it, it, it almost verges on the conspiracy. But uh, I think George Orwell has had a similar uh, sort of conclusion or, or certainly going towards the same argument, uh, that there is something structurally flawed uh, within modern democracies, modern societies, that uh, leads to a, a violent solution. There's a contradiction. Uh, I think flaw might be is too strong of a word for me, but there's a contradiction there uh, that that has to be addressed, and I think has to be accepted so that we can explore it. But yes. And I hope we will uh, definitely explore this further. But before we do that, one of the things that immediately struck me is when I read liberal state, and of course, there's a lot we might mean by that. But one of the questions I had was, you know, in the Cold War, we could certainly justify this idea of uh, the liberal state because it, it really was a uh, conflict between us and them that you can point to in a map and say, here, here is that Iron Curtain, here's that difference between the liberal democracies and whatever else. Today, these lines, are they getting a bit more blurred? What, what constitutes a liberal state? What sets it apart? What do we mean by liberal state today in 2021? Well, there's, uh, there's certainly an idea that, uh, you know, liberal, it's capital L liberal, not the, not the small L uh, as, as in domestic politics. But it's this idea that property rights matter, civil rights matter, human rights matter. And those, uh, the idea of justice and equality, that these are written into the bureaucracy of the state, that there are mechanisms to address inequalities in any of, any of those areas. Now, geopolitically, uh, the idea of the liberal West uh, has emerged and, and you know, we, there's ad nauseum arguments all the time about the liberal West and, 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 and just the idea of the West itself. But we can say Great Britain, the United States, Canada, France, Germany, Australia, Japan, there are others, but there's a nucleus of countries that uh, kind of sit in that liberal circle. It's easy then to kind of identify the illiberal. Now there's two levels to this illiberal vis-a-vis um, -vis the Ouroboros. 
you know, the first one, which I don't really touch on, is illiberal states, China, Russia, North Korea, uh, in, in a lot of sense, uh, Cuba. Uh, but in regards to these small wars, the illiberal are these groups that oppose the liberal order. So, uh, for example, the Taliban in Afghanistan, by no means are they liberal Wilsonian Democrats. Uh, what they what the Taliban did is they rejected the idea of the liberal West, and so they identified themselves as a target. So, so the, the idea of the liberal West itself, you know, people argue about it all the time. But I think uh, at, at 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 a certain level, people understand what the liberalism is. They understand what the liberal West is, and and they kind of understand that there are states that are illiberal, and there are groups that are illiberal non-state actors uh, are, is, is a phrase that gets bandied about quite a bit. Certainly Kant, uh, if we go back as far as him, would have agreed that there is such a thing, of course, as the liberal state, as a liberal democracies, and that they don't tend to go to war with each other. This is a rule that, um, that's been thrown around a lot in discussions for international relations and is most more or less held up to be true. There is something about liberal states, uh, certainly they don't like to declare war on each other. In World War II, at least, we can see that uh, right up until the very last moment uh, with uh, Germany's tra Nazi Germany's transgressions, it had uh, a, a preferred appeasement. Uh, there's a long trajectory and a long heritage of, we can certainly say hesitance and using violence as a last means. There is a conflictive relationship, perhaps, uh, between the peoples in, a, in liberal democracy, people power, and accepting willy-nilly foreign crusades or certainly aggressions. But using ancient Greece as an example, I think this is very interesting. You know, where, where we historically trace the, the root of democracy, certainly these city-states didn't have much of a problem declaring war on one another. And, you know, from Thucydides onwards, it's listened with all sorts of minor disputes uh, that sometimes led to, unfortunately, entire cities being razed, as was the common practice. Why do liberal states today need to go above and beyond to justify the wars? Uh, this is, uh, there, there's a lot to unpack here. Um, just uh, right off the bat, uh, since 1945, uh, you know, the nuclear umbrella uh, has really limited uh, uh, the ability of states to go to war to achieve uh, uh, changes in the system. But uh, it, it, it may be fascinating to your listeners to know that uh, the three states that have gone to war to the most, uh, however you define war, and there's plenty of definitions of war, but let's, your, your listeners are smart enough to know what it is when they, when they hear about it or see about it, are Great Britain, the United States, and uh, Soviet Union. Those are the three states that have gone to war the most since 1945. Uh, and I'm, I'm something of an economic, uh, 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 academic, uh, political economy was, was really where I, I, I like to be. And uh, the reason why liberal states go to war so much is to maintain their position in the international system. The, the reason the United States has gone to war so much is because it is the largest benefactor of the current liberal system. All the riches of the world flow to the United States. And so the United States spends a, a trillion dollars a year maintaining that system, uh, keeping it free from threats. Uh, but you know, that <clears throat> Kant's democratic peace, right? So, so it's been studied, uh, it's one of the most studied uh, concepts in international relations. Uh, and, and it has largely been true since 1945 in that great powers, democracies don't go to war with themselves, but great powers, democracies, the United States and Great Britain do go to war against what they see as threats to that international economic order. Um, the, uh, the, now, would the United States go to war with China? Um, you know, China's not a democracy in any sense. Uh, I, I, I I don't think that would happen, nor do I think China would uh, would would go to war either, because the the global economy has now become so integrated. China is so integrated into the global economy. If China were to attack Taiwan, uh, capital would would flee China. Now, that's not to say that over the next twenty years, as the West pulls back from China because of what's happened over the last few years, that China may 
find may not find itself in a position of, of having nothing to lose. I don't think uh, so. So the democratic peace theory largely holds up. Uh, some people call it the McDonald's peace theory. No two countries with McDonald's have ever gone to war. Uh, and McDonald's being a a, uh, a kind of uh, 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 a, uh, a, sim- a symbol of an integrated global uh, consumer economy. I've never heard of the McDonald's theory, but uh, certainly I can see how the Great Britain might declare war on the U.S. over the uh, dreaded filet of fish. <laughs> so, what one way, uh, if if my to understand the Ouroboros, the concept that w- that we're talking about here, and of course the subject of of your thesis and your book, might it be useful to understand this as sort of unresolved natural tension between? liberal and state. On the one hand, the liberal element of that phrase pulls towards, as, you, as you've uh, listed, a human rights, equality, justice, mm-hmm. uh, diversity, inclusion, etc., etc. And on the other hand, we have state, which is an older construct, uh, an older body, um, follows more eternal, uh, timeless things, interests, material needs. Uh, it feels uh, afraid of its neighbours, it's competitive, mm-hmm. etc. Is it useful to think of the Ouroboros as, as trying to marry these two things to Together and then finding, oh, there's all of these uh, different things that pop up. Sure. So uh, kind of what you're, what you're heading towards is this idea of uh, this urge towards humanitarian assistance, right? Liberalism and liberal states see themselves as the good goal. Like everyone wants to be like us. Everyone wants to have what we have, uh, electricity and clean water and health care and all the things that make that possible, which are civil rights and property rights and human rights. And, and in order, and, and so when, when a liberal state, liberalism, I, I have to almost turn it into a noun, it's, and that's a little difficult in and of itself. Liberalism says, if we are good, we are good because we can identify something out there in the periphery that is bad. And as time goes on in that periphery, Somalia in 1992 comes to mind. The, the West, the, li- the liberal West says, we must go in there and help fix Somalia. And of course, what happened? Uh, it, it, it's turned into a 30-year civil war. Uh, the United States isn't really involved anymore. Uh, policy-wise, I think the United States is now uh, uh, pulling out a lot of its support from Somalia. And so, uh, so absolutely, you know, that's one of those contradictions we talked about, right? So, so liberalism sees itself as a good, but it can only be the good because it's identified the bad, the illiberal other, and it wants to go fix it. It wants to say, hey. Uh, we have we we have to fix you because you're a threat to our way of life, which is which is in itself a contradiction. In no way, shape, or form was Al Qaeda an existential threat to America. It certainly could kill a lot of people, which it did on 9/11. But but no one was was calling up uh, Al Qaeda in Afghanistan saying we we love you, we support your system, let's form a, a block of of nations and states and groups. None of that was happening. And yet the U.S. still felt compelled to go to war and then to democratize Afghanistan. And we, we've seen that, that that's failed. We've seen these ventures as well, not only in the case of Somalia, of course, but Iraq, Afghanistan, and perhaps going all the way back to Vietnam. Uh, similar, you could say a similar popular will, popular belief that, hey, mm-hmm. uh, we have a great way of life here. Uh, you know, why don't, why don't we go and, and uh, install it over there? It's for, it's for your good. But I find the last point that you made very interesting, this, this concept of uh, liberalism almost creating the enemies that it then needs to go and, and hunt down and convert. Uh, it's this it's sort of a missionary zeal that is added and almost necessary for the Casus Belli to stand. But can you guide us through a little bit more about how this works? How uh, you mentioned it as identity in your thesis about counterinsurgency as an identity war. Can you guide us through how are these identities that are perceived to be hostile to the liberal state, how are they created and how, how are they resolved and why are they necessary? Sure. Uh, you know, identity, uh, th- these are ethnicity studies. Uh, so anthropology uh, really comes from that, that field of academics. But uh, an ethnic group, uh, you could, one can identify it from the outside because uh, common language, common religious beliefs, common rituals, uh, they tend to perpetuate the group through intermarriage, uh, child birth, child rearing. Um, but, but the key, and this is the identity advantage that negates the technological advantage of states, 
is that the group sees itself as the group. It's not so much that the outsider says, yes, those people are those people. It's that people inside the group say, yes, I am the chosen, part of the chosen people. I am this group. And then what what happens is when the liberal West or, or liberalism identifies them as illiberal and in need of policing or, uh, or violence, as the case may be, that group then feels under threat. Uh, and this is particularly true uh, when groups are able to use religion. And, and so religion constitutes sacred beliefs. In other words, I speak English and English is a characteristic of my ethnicity. But I can go learn French, I can learn Chinese, I can learn uh, uh, Tagalog and go live in those countries, right? Uh, because my connection to my language is much less strong than my connection to my God. Uh, God is the end all be all. God is my sacred belief. Without that, I, I can't change my belief in God. And so what happens is these, uh, these small groups then are able to use religion as a mobilization factor towards violence because a threat to their religion is a threat to their existential self, right? And so in the West, we don't see that. If, if uh, in, in World War I, when France and Germany were fighting, uh, it, was, it was basically an economic war, right? But these small groups like the Taliban, the ISIS, Al-Shabaab, Boko Haram, see the West as attacking their identity and, and their identity is, is mobilized through this idea of religion. And so they can't give it up. They, they absolutely, if, if they can't just change, they must fight to survive. Now we're talking about something that is much more than just uh, an economic war, as you suggested, but almost becomes a, a total conflict that uh, transcends the individual and yes. becomes almost transformative in nature. But the the interesting thing about uh, the your thesis and your book is that uh, it's not just Al Qaeda doing this; it's also us in the liberal world that have a transformative zeal. That, that is totalitarian in an aspect of saying we cannot coexist in a world yes. where you are a liberal and we are a liberal. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so here in the West, you know, we believe that, you know, civil rights and human rights, uh, our, our ideals of ourselves, this Madisonian, Wilsonian uh, impetus is incompatible with traditional patriarchal or authoritative societies. And, and so this this cat is in the meta theory, uh, you know, well above uh, 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 some of the some of the case studies. But it, you mentioned Koswitz, Koswitz concept of absolute war. Absolute war is when two values are, are competing against each other. And so you have the other mobilized primarily in the 21st century so far through religion. Mm -hmm. uh, there's sacred beliefs. And yes, in the West, we have our own sacred beliefs. It, it, it isn't God. It's the idea that, uh, that our way of life is incompatible with your way of life. 9-11, the horrible attacks on 9-11 is a jumping point for many of topics that we study today. And uh, especially so, uh, I think many people could view it as the start of, or certainly a central point in uh, the war on terror and what eventually became the, uh, the war in Afghanistan and, and of course, uh, Iraq. Your thesis and your work on the liberal transformative mission of liberal states, I can almost think of jumping back to World War II and thinking of that actually as a starting point for this total clash of values, as you suggest. Which is more useful to think about it? When did this begin? And what is the role of 9-11 in all of this? So, so it goes back to early, earlier in our discussion, we, we, there's almost two lenses. You have liberal states and illiberal states. You have the United States and China. Uh, and, and, and conflict between those are going to play out in a different way than conflict between a liberal state, a liberal way of life and an illiberal way of life. So those illiberal ways of life, and this is something that's, that's very important. Generally, these great powers are able to go to war against these illiberal groups these ident in these identity conflicts simply because they can. The, the United States, the Soviet Union in Afghanistan, the French in Algeria were able to, because of their 
their rich, their rich uh, uh, economics were able to project power into the periphery. All right, the, the cost of war, the French, the Soviets, and the United States said the cost of war there is, is lower than what we think we'll get back in return. Uh, liberal states and illiberal states, the cost of war is high. The United States knows that a war with China would cost tens of trillions of dollars and may end with the, the destruction of the U.S. way of life. China knows the same thing. And so there's, there's much more of a dance there, right? This is what we call security under the nuclear umbrella. But, uh, but 9-11, you know, no one expected uh, Afghanistan to, to turn into a 20-year war. Uh, no one expected a... Iraq to turn out the way it did uh, after the U.S. left. ISIS, of course, came back. Uh, but it goes back to this idea that, you know, great, great powers, the United States, uh, it, it can interject itself. Power is passive. Force is active. It can project force into these areas. Uh, and, and um, you know, uh, George W. Bush in his first uh, national security strategy in 2002 you know, he didn't he didn't talk about going to war in Iraq. He talked about addressing the causes of instability and internal conflict that leads to the rise of groups like Al Qaeda. And, and that's that humanitarian impulse. Hey, we're, we're good. We're, we're the liberal West. Our way is the best. And we can we need to help everyone see things the way we do. I think one point that I was relating back to, as you were just saying, that is it's interesting when we view uh, the actions, especially after 9-11, uh, under the lens of the Ouroboros, under the lens of the transformative mission of the liberal state and its intolerance to the intolerant, uh, mm -hmm. uh, maybe another way of putting it. And um, and what I was thinking back to is right, you know, when, when decisions are fundamentally based on values, uh, which is an ethereal concept, which is mm -hmm. almost an ideological concept, uh, then the outcomes are not always precise. It's not always Klaus Wirtz sitting down and, and doing a mathematical equation of how much, how many years do we need in Afghanistan? Uh, they're mm -hmm. often led by popular will. And, uh, you know, I remember as a child uh, when September 11th happened and uh, it, the television was wheeled in. Uh, I was just a child in school at the time, but it was an overbearing sense of pain and loss. And the, and the world felt that way for, you know, for a long time after, was still today. And um, when we're talking about emotional uh, decisions, when we're talking about values, when we're talking about ideology, when we're talking about transformative missions, we're talking about, uh, you know, the world of feelings of the subjective. How much of an impact do you think this has on then finding out 20 years later, uh-oh, we've been fighting a regular war that we're completely unprepared against? And how do these two relate, the irregular asymmetric war and the transformative Ouroboros? Well, we talk about that, that Ouroboros. Um, you know, Al-Qaeda uh, executed 9-11, and the United States went into Afghanistan uh, with its allies. It went into Iraq with its allies. And, and what happened? Al-Qaeda became ISIS. ISIS became Boko Haram, became Al-Shabaab, became uh, you know, Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb. It, it just keeps going on and on. That's what identity conflict does. Uh, the, you know, Boko Haram in, that, in northern Nigeria may never have seen uh, a, an Arab Al-Qaeda guy, but you know, they, they use that religion to kind of say, hey, we're all in this boat together. Um, and so that's on, on the irregular side, on the illiberal side, that's how these conflicts keep going, right? So, but on the, on the liberal side, uh, that's, that's one of the things that, that liberalism does. It has a mechanism which can, can correct imbalances. And so in 9-11, you know, we, we, uh, the United States went to war, the world went to war. And slowly over the last 20 years, We've been listening to citizens. We've been listening to our academics saying, you know, this isn't working. You're, you're actually making things worse by projecting your force into the periphery. There's got to be a better way to engage these groups uh, nonviolent ways. Um, and that's something that, 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 that really sets the liberal system apart from the illiberal system. The liberal system has that mechanism, open dialogue, uh, elections that lead to changes. It takes a lot longer to get there. It takes, because you have to build consensus. Illiberal states and illiberal societies can just dictate the change. They don't have to listen to everyone. Uh, and that is a, that is a key difference uh, between the liberal and the illiberal. 
But uh, back to back to the Ouroboros, you know, 9-11 uh, spawned a multitude of uh, extremist groups around the globe. Uh, and and, and uh, so that was an unintended uh, consequence of of 9-11. The consequence of 9-11 was uh, a war that lasted a lot longer than anyone had hoped or wanted and the, and the result that nobody uh, really anticipated or wanted either. I mean, we see now uh, incredibly uh, power sharing agreement between the Taliban and the and the Afghan government, uh, something that would have been seemed perhaps unthinkable uh, back in 2001. But this is the reality of a regular mm -hmm. war. And I think you mentioned a bit of this in, in your work. The military complexes that spawned from them were spawned from the experience of fighting army versus army in a pitch battle. Uh, mm -hmm. and of course, the rules of the game have changed so drastically. Uh, and in, in that light, can you talk to us a little bit about the difference between force and power? Sure. Uh, it, it's pretty simple. Um, power is, is passive. Power is what's generated internally. Uh, so uh, a, a large country like the United States with a, a, with a vast population and this really uh, vibrant economy that just that just creates stuff out of nothing, right? That's power. Force is when you project it; uh, it's its active expression of power. And of course, there's there's the multiple ways power can be transformed into force. And uh, so, for example, you know, the Department of State uh, generally uses nonviolent means, and it goes in to address causes of instability and insecurity. Uh, things that might lead to the rise of groups like ISIS or Al Qaeda. Well, uh, the most popular way, and we can thank Hollywood for this and, and, and a trillion dollar budget, is to take power, internally produced power, and turn it into force in the form of the war machine. Uh, and, and the war machine is not just you know tanks, it's the entire enterprise. And it projects itself into that periphery. And so force generates a counter force. You know, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. You know, some of this stuff, 10-year-olds uh, would understand. And unfortunately, you know, 50-year-old leaders in Congress and parliaments don't understand. But when you drop uh, force in the form of a war machine, a division or a brigade in the periphery, it's going to generate a reaction. Hmm. Uh, and so that's that's key to understanding is not just, you know, power and force. It's, it, it's what force does when it's out there. A good calculation is almost seems to elude us of, of how exactly the force applies and is transformed into the kind of change that the liberal state wishes to see. Afghanistan keeps coming to mind as, as we um, as we come at such a critical moment now. The incredible power of the United States economy, as you suggested, and of course the incredible force of its war machine, uh, as you've illustrated, uh, was still not enough to reach the desired outcome in a country that is, uh, if you know, under basically any metric, uh, uh, economically light years behind uh, the United States. Uh, the liberal status almost had to make room for the illiberal Taliban. Now, I'm sure the Taliban has made promises of change. At, at the heart of the Taliban is still a very much a religious uh, mission and perhaps a, uh, an application of that religion. Uh, that is certainly more um, more conservative. So, how why is this the case? Why uh, how much power is enough power? How much force is enough force to go into a country halfway around the world and say, uh, we need you to be liberal? Well, the short answer is there, there's no amount of power and there's really no amount of force uh, that can overcome that. I what I call the identity advantage, uh, the ability to transmit these uh, this existential this feeling of existential threat from one generation to the other you know you, you bring up Afghanistan because that's been uh, you know a part of our lives for 20 years but uh, to me if you go back to the 1950s uh, France and Algeria you know France had France believe was the first to believe it had this uh, humanitarian mission to uh, civilize uh, the other uh, in Algeria, and it it you know it it tried for for many years, and Algeria got its independence, and then thirty years later devolved into a horrible civil war in the nineties. Uh, so so you know if history is a guide, there there may not be much hope for Afghanistan. But one of the things that I, I, you're leading towards is this idea of preemption, right? So if uh, if great powers like the United States and France and the Soviet Union. Uh, can't go into this periphery and change things with its war machine, what can the war machine do 
to secure a liberal state. And, and that was uh, towards the end of the book, I really kind of got into that. And I talked about preemption. It's uh, preemption is the idea that uh, technology allows us to do violence uh, below the perception of, of the public. Uh, and and that's, that's really problematic. One of the things that comes to mind is is now the future of counterterrorism. We'd be wrong to think things are sort of uh, now with the extinction of Daesh, if we want to call it that. Uh, there's always a temporary lull, and and it almost seems to work in a cyclical fashion that we have the, the next group, and as you suggested, you know the linkage between Al Qaeda to Boko Haram, and then the next thing that comes along. If force and power are not enough to go into these countries and and eradicate it at the root, what lessons can can we draw? I mean, if force and power is not enough to defend against the illiberal other, in this case, the, the weaponized, what can we do outside of force and power? The, certainly the, the U.S. Department of Defense and, and a lot of Western countries uh, and authoritarian countries have gone this route of using technology uh, to, to kind of uh, allow them to see everything uh, before it happens. And so there was this, uh, you know, a, a long time ago, a one country would attack another country, the second country would defend itself and then attack. And then we kind of said, okay, well, we don't want to wait to get attacked. So we came up with these theories of preventative war. And we said, oh, well, when that country is massing troops on the border, uh, what we'll do is we'll do a preventative attack. We'll attack those troops and that preventative war will then, will then it, it's, it's, it, it's a smaller war than if we wait for the attack. And now we've kind of slid into this preemption where the idea that uh, another state or another group might attack us is enough to generate the application of force in the periphery. And, and that's where technology comes in, right? So we have these drones. Uh, Kami Yu wrote, uh, he's a French fellow, wrote a great book about seven or eight years ago called The Theory of the Drone. And it's basically that uh, the drone, it just hovers, technology hovers above life as life is occurring and then it, the technology allows decision makers to decide, I don't like the way this is going. It is, it is illiberal and therefore it is against my way of life. There, if it's against my way of life, it's a threat. And so we must destroy it. And so it's the marriage of this, this kind of high technology and artificial intelligence because it takes artificial intelligence to really gather all this information mm. uh, that, that really, uh, uh, bodes ill for the future of warfare. One of the questions that comes to mind when you say this is, it doesn't seem as though technology really offers a, offers a solution to this contradiction, but rather the opposite. What you're describing is a, is a sort of hellish dystopia by which we say, not only is the liberal state unable to resolve this contradiction, it's actually just going to employ technology to wash its hands clean and say, uh, you know, this doesn't exist, and actually just make this even worse. It's, it is. I, I, I'm, I'm on the side that uh, preemption of this kind uh, does make things worse. And, you know, we talked about contradictions of contradictions of contradictions. And uh, I said that, you know, one of the things that liberalism has is it has this mechanism to correct itself, this openness and this dialogue. Uh, what has happened in the, in the West, particularly with the United States, is that drone strikes uh, occur below the level of public perception. And this really goes to the, the sense of justice. And I got to walk the dog a little bit. So this, this is uh, kind of some high philosophy here, but, but justice requires risk, right? The risk to the party administering the justice. That, that means that if I'm going to take it upon myself to kill you, there is a risk to me to do so. And I am willing to accept that risk. So let's go back to December 7th, 1941. Uh, Japan attacked the United States. The United States voted to go to war. They said, we will go to war. We risk war, death to millions and millions of Americans in order to get justice for the attack on Pearl Harbor. Now, if you fast forward to 2021, these drone strikes are, are being controlled by uh, the Department of Defense. And, and, and some would say the CIA is still conducting them, although there's discussion that uh, it's been taken out of the hands of the CIA. But is that justice when the perpetrators of the justice cannot be touched? 
So if in the liberal periphery in these areas in the Sinai, uh, uh, in Yemen, in Somalia, when a drone strike occurs, they, they can't fight back. There's no, there's no person standing across the valley from them. There's no person in the building with them. And so if there's no risk to this country executing the drone strikes, is that really just war? And that, that is the problem with, uh, with high technology and with AI, uh, because if the public isn't at risk, the public doesn't care. Nothing, very little has changed for Americans uh, in particular since 9-11. Uh, we still go shopping. Our economy is still growing. We're still buying cars and homes. Uh, and yet thousands and thousands of people are being killed in our name. Mm. Uh, and, and so if there's no risk to me, then I, I don't, you know, I don't care. The, the average American will not advocate for a change in this policy. And so the policy runs amok and the policymakers say, well, drone strikes are work. They're cheap. Let's keep doing it. Visibility is such a key factor here. Immediately what comes to my mind as well is distance because one of the challenges, uh, and this goes back thousands of years, but one of, one of the challenges to warfare uh, has been the the almost the emotional heat of the moment decision of the soldier to kill another soldier, mm -hmm. and you you traditionally you need a lot of mythos, <laughs> you need a lot of ideology, you need to, whatever a concoction of all kinds of things to convince a human being go out there and, and kill as many as you can today, tomorrow, the day mm -hmm. after, and and in a way I think it could also say well that is a, a natural barrier for liberal states not to engage in too much uh, illiberal means of destruction. You know, the way that you could think of the, the Wehrmacht in World War II uh, zealed up with their mission. Liberal states don't tend to think of their armies this way and, and don't train their soldiers to become death machines uh, because there's a visibility aspect to doing that. Mm -hmm. you know, the American public in this case would know, hey, uh, you know, what are you doing? But the interesting thing about that you just mentioned with these drone strikes is how invisible it is, not only to the public that is ultimately responsible for enacting policy, um, but also to the, the practitioner, because I think there was there was a study, I, I'm quoting things off my hat here, but um, there was a study that measured how much distance from the, the event uh, taking place. Uh, in mm -hmm. this case, you have a, a drone operator that could be you know thousands of miles away and the drone itself doing the killing. And there was a, a lot less reprehension, a, a lot less of a barrier to being able to execute to mm -hmm. kill, uh, the more distanced you are. And I wonder if we can apply that to a, a more macro scale. Is technology blurring that visibility? Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, I think you might be referring to the, the psychological cost of killing by uh, a fellow named Grossman came out about, uh, about 1995, 1996. And he, he mentioned that um, the, the, what it takes to stab a man uh, because you're that close, you, you feel his breath, you feel his blood, that the toll, the emotional toll is much higher uh, and it lessens as the, as the various means of violence are used, pistol, rifle, artillery, bombers. Um, and, and so, yeah, so there's, there's very much a, 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 that, that distance aspect you talk about, there's physical and emotional. And what drones have done is it's removed both the physical distance, you know, the physical distance has increased quite a bit, and that the emotional distance has uh, has has somewhat increased. I have read some interesting uh, articles, uh, some some research done that says the drone operators in Nevada, uh, these drones hover for eight, nine, ten hours. Uh, they get to know these people, uh, these young men, are, are husbands and sons and fathers, and they're with their families, and they're at a celebration, and then they get in their car and the order comes to you know execute the drone strike. And so there's a, there, there still is an emotional cost, but, but it goes back to this idea of justice, right? That the soldier uh, always is told that you did it because we are seeking justice. And so when they come back and they have their emotional problems, there's this emotional toll. Ultimately, they are told, you are not a murderer. You are executing justice. You are an executioner. You're not a murderer. But, but uh, they, they, for me, the idea is that if the American public is not at risk, um, then it doesn't feel the, the, the pressure to address the policies. Uh, and so policymakers 
are using technology uh, in a way that uh, is, is probably going to backfire at some point when these uh, peripheral groups, these illiberal groups in the periphery say, we can't fight back against these drones. Uh, so let's go to Nevada and we'll blow up shopping malls and we'll kill people in their homes there. Mm. Uh, that's, that's the horrifying thought for me uh, anyway. Yeah, no, I can uh, certainly share how horrifying of a future that would be. One of the questions that springs to mind, as uh, as you've just mentioned that, is when we think about where all of this leads, uh, you think about the immediate future in the next five, ten years, and how the liberal states will develop. Do you think it's more likely that the liberal will finally defeat, consume, and eat the illiberal or that uh, technology actually transforms us into the illiberal monster? I, I'm, I'm something of an optimist. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, like I said, liberal states take a long time to change, but I think it's finally happening. I think after 20 years, there's less of an appetite uh, to go in and, and, and transform these areas into, you know, Springfield, Virginia, or, you know, New York City, or, or whatever the case may be. I think there's an understanding that for these 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 tribal patriarchal groups, uh, uh, it change will occur. They they will come into the present. You know, cell phones, the proliferation of consumer technology like that makes it ever harder for small groups of elites, uh, patriarchs, as it, as it were, to maintain power mm -hmm. to keep triggering that call to violence uh, through those ethnic ties. Uh, so I, so I'm an optimist there. I I I, I the appetite just isn't there any longer, I think. Uh, and, and we've seen it. Uh, the president, uh, Biden, has, has said it's over. We're getting out of Afghanistan. You know, what the future holds for Afghanistan, you know, we can talk about. You know, we said Algeria 30 years later had its own civil war. I think similar things will happen in Afghanistan. But uh, but no, the the uh, I, I'm pretty I'm pretty sure that there's there's no real amount of power or force that's going to overcome that identity advantage. Mm -hmm. um, it will fade over time. I certainly hope you are right as a liberal myself. But uh, I think it's, and I can certainly share in a vision of the future that you just said, in which, and, and if I can rephrase it here slightly, one in which the liberal state has learned to coexist almost with the liberal and a perfect example perhaps is saying, okay, you know, the Taliban it seems to not be going anywhere. Maybe the best approach is one of coexistence, but with a sort of tacit understanding that eventually we hope you'll change. <laughs> We're going to try the nice way now. Mm -hmm. uh, but 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 it's interesting, you know. There's always uh, sort of at the at the back of the argument. There's always an implication that uh, we we can coexist, but eventually you're going to have to liberalize. Can there ever be a coexistence in which the world says, uh, you know, there's certain areas of the world that will likely just never become liberal because of X factors? Or is that transformative mission always somehow baked into it? I, I think the, the, the urge to transform this humanitarian impulse is, is beginning to fade. There's an une uneasy coexistence uh, in the United States defense posture. You know, the policies are now one of... Um, Taliban, you can you can do what you, you're going to do in Afghanistan. But if you come out of Afghanistan, if you come to New York City or Chicago, uh, we're going to we're going to stop that. There are still problems with preemption. There's still problems with the hovering eye. Um, uh, but uh, I think that, yeah, we're 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 settling into an uneasy coexistence. Um, the idea is that illiberal states are a greater existential threat to the West, Russia, China, than groups like the Taliban or ISIS or Boko Haram. I, I do believe that you know France is heavily engaged in Africa. I think the United States and Great Britain will remain engaged in uh, low-level uh, conflict management, uh, if I can coin a phrase, uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. I, you know, Australia will always be there with us. But I, I think the we're, we're kind of going back towards uh, a more uh, traditional uh, international relations arena in which, you know, it's, it's, it's the great powers that, that are existential threats to each other. Uh, and, and we will exist, like you said, uh, uneasily, but we will coexist with groups like the Taliban and ISIS. Now, we're always going to try to manage our, uh, our pyramid, right? Like the United States has 
allies and partners and clients all throughout the world who are under threat from these groups. And so there's always going to be some engagement. We're, we're, we're simply not just going to be hands off. Um, One of the quotes that I picked out here from, from your work in Ouroboros 2017, and I'll just quote it straight at you, a never ending war of maintenance that sees terrible deeds done in the name of a great good. Now, I'm probably taking this quote completely out of context, so you'll have to correct me. But what I understood from this is largely what we've been talking about today, about this transformative mission of liberalism. And of course, once it identifies this liberal target, singling it out for sometimes mm -hmm. an aggressive excursion to say, right, we're going to liberalize you. But this is markedly different to the more positive end that we have here today, So, uh, which is one of, of course, of being able to see coexistence and seeing mm -hmm. real life examples of this playing out. Have these last four years um, changed your mind and would you end the book differently now? Uh, I, I think that even with our disengagement from Afghanistan and, and Iraq, uh, there, there'll still be violence being done. I, I just don't think that the United States is going to put 100,000 troops uh, in these small places any longer. Uh, the West has, like I said, clients. It has its own pyramids of uh, cooperation. And, and, and so that, that will occur. Nigeria is a partner with the United States. We both have common goals against Boko Haram. Uh, we, uh, we support countries uh, as part of the AU mission in Somalia against Al-Shabaab. Um, uh, we're working uneasily uh, with, with uh, Turkey. Uh, and of course, we're still in Iraq supporting Iraq against ISIS. And so the, the war of maintenance may not make it into the headlines, but it's still going to be occurring. Coexistence doesn't mean an end to violence. So things are, are still going to be done. Uh, I just, uh, I don't think that uh, you're going to see 100,000 troops uh, from any Western country put into some of these places, uh, not for the foreseeable future. Well, I certainly hope not. One last question that I've got for you today, uh, Phil, is a bit of a strange one. But uh, throughout today, of course, we've been talking about international relations. We've been talking in the big picture. We've been talking about almost United States foreign policy, foreign relations. There's always the, the other which is on a map that you can point to. But actually, this question is uh, flipping it on its head. And it's if we can actually internalize some of the conclusions that we've reached uh, today uh, that you explore more in your book um, about this, this contradiction and this transformative element that we can find within liberalism, uh, the liberal state. But if we can internalize that into the liberal section of society, uh, because perhaps it would be wrong to assume of the liberal state as entirely liberal, or, or certainly mm -hmm. there are hierarchies of liberalism within the mm -hmm. liberal state, including very unliberal elements. Uh, and I'm sure the US this year with the storming of the US Capitol and uh, all of the drama of the last four years of the Trump presidency can uh, attest to that. But looking at this as an internal political dimension, can, can we see a correlation between a liberal segment, a liberal party, if you will, uh, that has a transformative seal that definitely believes themselves to, uh, in many cases, uh, have the moral upper hand and, and see themselves as progressive as a word they use mm -hmm. uh, against uh, the illiberal other, uh, perhaps a more conservative element in society that does not wish to be transformed. Mm -hmm. Is there any parallel here? And can you talk to us about that? Sure, uh, sure there is. You know, the uh, identity Politics and identity conflict, uh, the, the rules of that are, are basically the same anywhere. You know, in the United States after January 6th, a lot of people realized that, you know, there's about 20 to 25 percent of the U.S. population broadly in the South and uh, some, some, some in the West uh, that sees themselves put upon by the lowercase L liberal progressive policies that, that seek greater civil rights and greater uh, wealth uh, redistribution. Uh, and and what I what I tell everyone is a hey, you know we need to lower the boiling point a little bit we need to uh, reduce some of the rhetoric uh, because what we're doing is by identifying ourselves as we are the good you are you are making other people go what I'm bad and then when they feel that they're under threat they they tie themselves closer together and that rhetoric becomes extreme right because everyone wants to be heard and so one person says one thing. The next person doubles down on it. And then the echo chamber of social media kind of brings it all to this boiling point 
and you know 20 to 25 percent of americans only are listening to themselves and now they feel that there's a war on white or or, or something to that effect the election was stolen or, or something to that effect uh but yeah identity politics and identity conflict uh are are tricky and i just i always encourage everyone i talk to to just dial it back a little bit um Farmers are farmers uh, and they're good people, but let's not trigger them. And, you know, progressives in New York City are, are good people. Uh, let's not trigger them. Let's understand that there's multiple ways to uh, to be good people. Well, we might disagree on New Yorker, certainly, Phil. But uh, <laughs> I say this as a as a NYU alumni. Uh, but I certainly agree with you. I think that the, the lessons that we that we have collectively in the West learned uh, about coexistence uh, and uh, as a path forward between states could be applied to us as well in our lives uh, and and domestically at home. And with that, Phil, I want to thank you so much for taking part of this wonderful, brilliant conversation with uh, a lot of questions that will have a lot of questions to them as well. And so having said that, it would be a privilege and an honor to have you over for another episode. Dr. Philip Reynolds is a prolific man and he's written a lot of things. So I'm sure uh, our audiences would uh, would love to have you back. But course, um, thank, you. thank you so much for taking part today and uh, hope we'll hear back from you soon. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Am I Cynic? If you want to listen to our other episodes, leave your comments and feedback, or to support this project, please consider following us on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, and of course, to check out our website at www.micynic.com. I hope to see you there for next time and wish each of you a great rest of your week. Thank you.